Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. In this video, we are going to be talking about the tragic loss of Helios Airways Flight 522. How the faulty position of one single switch in the cockpit led up to this accident. Now, there will be mentioning of loss of life in this episode, so if that's something that you are sensitive to, I suggest that you stop watching right now. All right, guys, so this is the next episode in my series about famous incidents and accidents and what led up to them. If you want to see more of this, I have a playlist with all of the other episodes up here. And as always, all of the things that I'm going to tell you in this episode is taken straight from the final report, which I have linked to in the description of this video. So as always, when it comes to major incidents and accidents in the aviation world, there's always several components involved. And that is definitely the case here as well. Now, you might ask yourself, why does he keep telling us about these things? What's the point? Maybe you're a nervous flyer and you don't feel like listening to this at all. The fact is that it is very important for you to understand that investigating any incidents and accidents out there and then sharing the information that comes out of those investigations is a cornerstone in what makes the aviation business so safe. The fact that we never kick anything under the rug, the fact that we always go to the bottom of why something negative has happened and we learn from it and we get better, that's the reason that by far aviation is one of the safest ways of transport. So, this accident really started the day before. So, on the 13th of August uh, 2005, the 737-300, which was going to become the accident aircraft, came in after a normal flight. The cabin crew had reported that they had heard some strange kind of bangs and noises from the right aft door and they had also noticed that the seal to the door looked like it was frozen, which would indicate that there might be a pressurization issue here. So the cabin crew wrote that up in their cabin logbook, they then transferred that into the main aircraft logbook and the engineers were told about it. The engineers took over the aircraft at night, they did their normal maintenance inspections, but they also did a pressurization check of the aircraft. Now to do this, you have to follow very strict uh, guidance. Boeing in this case has a maintenance manual and the maintenance manual tells you exactly step by step what you need to do in order to, for example, check the pressurization system. The engineer on duty took help from an off-duty engineer that was awaiting a um, a flight going home and they went on board and they started setting the aircraft up to pressurize it to see if there was any leak that they could notice. A part of doing that is going into the cockpit and switching the pressurization mode selector from auto, which is where the two pressurization computers in the aircraft takes care of the pressurization of the aircraft automatically, to manual, where where you have to toggle a little switch to open and close the outflow valve. The reason they did that was because they needed to close the outflow valve in order to pressurize the aircraft using the APU and to see if there was any leak that they could notice. So this was done. Um, He stated that they couldn't find any leak and they also stated that after the procedure was done that they followed the maintenance manual guidance and reset the cockpit the way it was, which would indicate that the pressurization mode selector was switched back from manual to auto. However, subsequent investigation showed that that was not the case. The uh, switch was most likely left in manual. So, this leads us to the morning of the fateful flight. Uh, on the morning, around 5 o'clock uh, local time, on the 14th of August 2005, the flight crew and cabin crew convened in order to do their pre-flight brief- briefings. The captain is a 59-year-old uh, German citizen. Um, he has extensive flight experience, uh, more than 16,000 hours. Uh, and there has been some reports from first officers in the airline that he is a little bit rough to fly with, as in he can be very direct, he's very standard operator, procedure driven, uh, a little bit rigid, and maybe not so friendly to fly with. However, other first officers seem to have no problem with him at all. So this could be a cultural thing. 
The first officer is 51 years old, also very experienced, a senior first officer with over 7,000 hours. And when they looked through his training records, they found that there was mention about um, him skipping some standard operating procedures at times and sometimes skipping steps when operating the, uh, the QRH, the Quick Reference Handbook non-normal checklist as well. That could become important as we go forward. Anyway, the crew did their pre-flight. They went out to the, uh, the cockpit and started setting it up. Now, what you need to understand is that when you set up a 737, there are specific areas of responsibilities. So the first officer have certain parts of the cockpit that he is responsible for, and the captain have other parts of the cockpit. And then after they have done their duties, well, then you run through a checklist to make sure that all of the switches are in their correct position, right? The first officer did his duties and part of that was setting up the pressurization panel. So it was his responsibility to make sure that the, uh, the air conditioning packs and the air conditioning bleeds were in the correct position, that the cruising altitude was set, that the landing altitude was set, but also that the pressurization mode selector was in auto. Now it should be said at this point that Sometimes when you do this, you are under what we call perceived time pressure, which means that you're looking at the clock, seeing that about we should take off in 10 minutes. I need to do this quickly. And the pressurization mode selector very rarely is touched, right? It is almost always in the auto position. So there is a possibility here that when the first officer did this pre-flight check, he just brushed past it without really looking too carefully on it. Okay. So then after the pre-flight was completed, they read the checklist. Now the way that the checklist is supposed to be read is by a, um, by a technique called read, look, listen. That means that the pilot monitoring, who's not going to be flying the leg, reads the checklist items. The pilot flying looks at whatever he's going to respond to, responds, and then the pilot monitoring checks that the response is correct, and then you go to the next point. So you read, you look and then you listen to what the response is. That's the way that the checklist is supposed to be done. Now, at this time, the checklist response to air condition and pressurization was PAX auto, bleeds on, set. Okay, so if PAX are auto, makes sense. Bleeds are on, also makes sense. But set included three different things. Not only the pressurization mode selector, but also the um, cruising altitude and the landing altitude set on the panel. At this point, they should have picked it up, right? Here, they definitely should have caught that that uh, switch is in the wrong position. Um, there is a light when the presentation mode selector is in manual. There's a green light illuminated to show that it's in the manual position. And when it's in auto, there are no lights. So there should be something that would be picked up here. But once again, if you rush the checklist or if there's something that you think that you know and you might be rhyming the checklist, which is when you just answer what the right answer is, and you don't look too carefully, this could have been omitted, and it was on this occasion. So, so the aircraft taxis out, it takes off at time 0607, and it's a normal takeoff. Now you might be asking yourself, how come that there's a green light for the pressurization mode selector in, in the manual? Shouldn't there be like a red light or an orange light or something? And the fact is that Pressurization selector being in manual could be a normal thing, right? We are able to fly the aircraft in manual mode and using a toggle switch to keep the outflow valve open and closed depending on what kind of cabin altitude we have. So there is a supplementary procedure for how to do this and that is only really used in case the pressurization normal computers, the controllers are not working, okay? But this is not a non-normal. Right? It's, it's a supplementary procedure and that's why it was green and not highlighted red or uh, amber as it would with a non-normal situation. Anyway, the aircraft takes up normally. In the after takeoff checklist comes the next air condition and pressurization check. And the reason that you see this coming in several checklists after each other is because the pressurization system is a life preserving system. It's there to make sure that the people inside of the aircraft are kept alive. So it's a very, very important system. So in the off the takeoff checklist, we should be looking through to make sure that the pressurization panel looks good, but also that the indicators are indicating the correct values. So we have differential pressure. 
that should show a difference between the outside pressure and the inside pressure. That diff pressure should be increasing as we climb. You also have the cabin altitude, which would indicate what altitude the cabin is keeping in relation to the normal altitude that we have. In this case, if they, they would have looked careful at this, they would have seen that the diff pressure was lower than normal, that the cabin altitude was higher than normal, almost the same as the altitude they were at, and that the cabin climb was much higher than normal. In a normal climb out, we would have about a thousand feet per minute rate of climb in the cabin, and here it would be maybe 2,000, 2,300, so more than double the normal rate of climb. For some reason, this was not done either. All right. Now, I really have to emphasize at this point, if you are watching this because you want to become a pilot, this shows how important application of procedures are. You know, the way that the procedures are written and described in our manuals has to be followed point by point, exactly the way it's written. Because if we don't, if we start omitting things, if we start to kind of blur over and just do things quickly to get it over with, you might miss some really, really important clues. Anyway, the aircraft continued to climb. The outflow valve, since it was now in manual, was just stuck. It was open at about 14 degrees. It did not move because that's what it was told to do. As the aircraft climbed through about 10,000 feet of uh, altitude, uh, there was the last communication with the previous air traffic controller. And the air traffic controller asked uh, Helios Airways Flight 522 which cruising altitude they wanted. The captain responded with 34,000 feet or flight level 340. And then they were cleared to climb all the way up to their cruising altitude. Now, sometimes we are cleared intermediate altitudes because of traffic. But in this case, there was likely little traffic. So they got the clearance all the way up to their cruising altitude. This was the last communication that air traffic control had with this aircraft. Because the next thing that happened was because of the now slow depressurization of the aircraft, the cabin altitude warning horn came on. Now, if you've heard the cabin altitude warning horn, you know that it's a really loud sound, okay? It's very, very annoying. And it is that for a purpose. That warning horn is there to tell you that you need to act on something really quickly. This is crucial. It's a really, really important alarm, all right? But now something happens that is hard to explain. Right now, there are a couple of things that happen in very rapid succession that is going to lead to this disaster. Because since the crew has failed to identify the cause of this, the, the uh, pressurization mode selector not being in auto, but being in manual instead, at this point, they now need to understand that, okay, we have a problem with our cabin altitude, we need to take the appropriate steps. And the appropriate steps that are hammered into every single pilot during training is that when you hear Stop. this alarm, oh. mask on. First thing you do is you put your oxygen mask on, you establish crew communication, and then you start dealing with the problem. And the reason that you need to do it in that order is because you might be climbing towards hypoxia. You might be getting yourself in a situation where your body cannot take up enough oxygen to function properly. And the first thing that's going to disappear is your ability to think straight, all right? It is your problem-solving capacity, your memory, and your judgment. So that's why it's so crucial to get the oxygen mask on. But in this case, something strange happened. Because after, just a few seconds after this alarm goes off, what the flight crew does is they disconnect the autopilot. And then eight seconds later, they connect the autopilot again, followed by disconnecting the auto throttle and then engaging it again. Okay? Now this is a strange reaction, but it becomes clear why they did that when they continue to climb and instead of doing the appropriate procedure for cabin altitude warning, the captain decides to call up their dispatcher in their headquarters. And the captain says that they're having a, a, an erroneous takeoff configuration warning. Now, takeoff configuration warning, you'll say. The fact is that in the 737, the takeoff configuration warning horn and the cabin altitude horn sounds identical. It's the same warning. The only difference here is the knowledge that is hammered into flight crew that the takeoff configuration warning 
which is a warning that tells the pilots that the aircraft is not properly set up for takeoff. Maybe the flaps are not set or the uh, stabilizer trim is not set or the parking brake is set, for example. Basically that the aircraft is not ready for takeoff. That warning can only be heard on the ground, right? Not in the air. If you hear this warning in the air, it's the cabin altitude warning. Now, now, in aircraft of the same type today, we also have a visual indication showing takeoff config warning or cabin altitude warning, a red light just in front of us. But that was as that came as a response to this accident. It wasn't there on the accident flight. So the captain has now started to go down the wrong path of thinking. And once you've started going out on a different path, Confirmation bias is likely to set in and you might have a huge problem getting back to the right way of thinking. The first officer seemed to just go along with the captain in this case. There's no indication that he did anything or said anything different at this point. Unfortunately, uh, the voice recorder has not been preserved for this part of the flight because the flight became so long that it started overwriting itself. So we don't know from the voice recorder what happened, but we can see from the flight recorder what happened. And what happened was that the aircraft continued to climb as the captain was now talking to the dispatcher and subsequently the engineer. And what the captain said was that they had this problem, take off config warning. Now at time 0614, okay, um, there's another couple of things that happens in the cockpit, and that is that the master caution light comes on. Now, when the aircraft climbs up through a cabin altitude of 14,000 feet, what will happen is that the passenger oxygen masks will fall down. And when they fall down, that's going to trigger a master caution overhead. And if you look up then, you'll see passenger oxygen on, right? That will indicate to any pilot that the passenger oxygen have fallen. And it will be a clear indication that something is up with your pressurization system. The problem is that another thing that happens is that the equipment cooling, which is there, it's a system there to cool the screens in the cockpit, the electronics in the cockpit, but also the electronics down in the E&E bay where we have all of our computers and so on. Uh, if that doesn't have enough air as in enough air density to cool the equipment properly, it will also warn us and there will be an equipment cooling off light coming on. Now these things could potentially happen very close to each other, depending on what kind of outside conditions we have. The only thing we know here is that the master caution light came on, it stayed on for almost a minute, which means that if one of these warnings came on and this warning master caution wasn't reset, it would not have popped up again if a secondary warning came on. And if the first indication they had was equipment cooling off, and then the passenger oxygen on came after that, they would not have noticed it. And this is what it looks like. Because when the captain is talking to the engineer, he's mentioning that he has problems with the uh, equipment cooling off. He asks where the circuit breakers are, because he thinks that this is what's causing the alarm, and he wants to get up and start looking for them. Now remember, all through this, the aircraft is still climbing. Okay, They're continuing to climb. The engineer doesn't understand what he's talking about. There's a little bit of a, a language barrier thing going on here. But the engineer asks if he's checked that the precision mode selector is in auto because he knows that he's been working on it. But there's no response back from the captain to this. So at the time 0620, the aircraft has now reached an altitude of 28,900 feet. That's the last time that the flight data recorder shows that someone is trying to communicate. That's the captain still communicating with the engineer. After that, there's no more sounds. There's no more indication that anything is happening inside of the cockpit from that point. So there's a very high likelihood that somewhere after 0620, both the first officer and the captain becomes incapacitated. Captain, potentially on the floor looking for circuit breakers. First officer as pilot flying in his seat. None of them wearing their oxygen masks. So what's going on in the cabin then? Well, in the cabin at this point, there would be huge confusion because the cabin crew is trained to deal with rapid depressurizations. And the way that they, they are supposed to deal with this is that as the uh, passenger oxygen masks fall down, they're supposed to sit down and put a mask on and await a call from the captain that 
they can breathe again. Basically, it's a call from the captain to get the purser up to the front to start briefing him or her. And that indicates that, yeah, now we're down to a safe altitude. So they are expecting when the masks drop down to just sit down, put the masks on and the aircraft should level off and then start to descend. And eventually they will get a call. However, in this case, the mask falls down, but the aircraft just continues to climb. And there's no indication from the cockpit that anything is happening. Now, the issue here is that we don't know exactly what happened in the cabin. What we do know is the way that the passenger oxygen system works is that that is chemically generated. So in each unit over each passenger row, there is a chemi chemical generator that once the mask falls down and someone pulls the mask down, the generator will start generating oxygen and it will generate oxygen for about 12 minutes. After that, there's no more oxygen coming out of that generator. The reason it's 12 minutes is because it is built to enable an emergency descent. And 12 minutes is more than enough for the aircraft to go from its maximum cruising altitude down to 10,000 feet. Not an issue. But in this case, the aircraft just continued to climb. It stayed at 34,000 feet. 12 minutes would have come and gone oxygen would have run out and the passengers would have become increasingly hypoxic. You have a time of useful consciousness of a few minutes. They think uh, after having checked through the flight data recorder that the cabin altitude was probably around 24,000 feet. But after that time of useful consciousness, you become incapacitated, you become unconscious. Now, in the cabin, there are oxygen cylinders. These oxygen cylinders are there to give therapeutic oxygen in case a passenger would need it. And they have several hours for one person uh, in, in those uh, oxygen cylinders. And it was shown after the crash that at least three of the four oxygen bottles on board had been used. We don't know how many of the cabin crew were actually using them. This was, was just one or several. But there's no indication that the cabin crew tried to enter the cockpit prior to later on in the flight. So right now, the aircraft has reached 34,000 feet and the uh, flight management computer is set up and programmed to fly its route towards Athens. So if the autopilot is engaged and they have been cleared to 34,000 feet, the aircraft will gladly climb up there and then it will fly on autopilot its programmed route, which is exactly what happens. Air traffic control in Nicosia, which is the air traffic control unit they were talking to, is trying several times to call them, up to six times within the next five, six minutes after their last contact. No one is answering. So they're starting to suspect that there's a problem with the radio here. But when the aircraft flies into the next airspace, this hunch, the fact that they might have a problem here, is not properly communicated to the next air traffic control unit. They mention it, that they haven't gotten in contact with them and that they would like the next unit to tell them if they do get into contact with them. But the proper protocol for turning over a loss of radio aircraft is not followed properly. Which means that the next controller doesn't realize that there is a problem and actually highlights the aircraft as blue, as in we have it in contact and it continues to fly. And it continues to fly past its top of descent. Several calls are being made, no response from the flight crew. The aircraft flies in, follows the approach procedure, but still at 34,000 feet, flies past the airport and into the holding pattern as part of its missed approach procedure. And it sits there at 34,000 feet. Now, here air traffic control knows that something is wrong and they hit the button. That will scramble two F-16 fighters that will intercept the aircraft. So these fighters, they fly up and they take a close look at the aircraft. And what they can see is that there appears to be a person in the first officer seat slumped over the controls. There's no person in the captain's seat and they can see in through the cabin that there are some passengers slumped over wearing their oxygen masks. But the problem here is that now the aircraft has been sitting and it's been flying for about six holding circuits in the holding over Athens airport. At time 0848, two hours and 41 minutes after takeoff, the fighters in the F-16 aircraft are uh, looking in and they see that someone is entering the cockpit. Okay. They can see that the person wearing a vest looks like a cabin crew uniform gets into the cockpit and sits down in the captain's chair. Now this, at this point we also have 
CVR voice recordings because this is just the last 30 minutes of the flight. And on the voice recordings you can hear that someone takes out the oxygen masks and puts it on. The problem is though, at only two minutes later, the left hand engine flames out because of fuel starvation. They are sitting there for hours. When the left engine uh, flames out, the aircraft starts turning towards the dead engine, it's turning towards the left and it also starts a descent. Now, only two minutes after that, the right engine also flames out due to fuel starvation. On the voice recorder, you can hear a voice calling Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Unfortunately, the uh, radios would have been set to the previous controller many hours ago. So that message did not come out needed, would it probably have made any difference. Because the uh, person that was at the controls was most likely one of the flight attendants um, who had a commercial pilot license, a CPL, but did not have a 737 type rating and it would have been impossible for him to have been able to fly this aircraft, nor on one engine and definitely not without any engine. It would have been on battery power at this point. Uh, he would have had to use manual reversion to fly the aircraft, which makes it very, very uh, heavy. So the fighters followed the aircraft down as it descended. Um, the person in the cockpit waved to them and when they signaled to him to follow them down towards the airport, he just gave a, a kind of pointed downwards indicating that they were going down. Now there were indications that there was input to the flight controls during the very last seconds of the flight where um, this person tried to level the aircraft out to, to reduce the impact forces of the aircraft but to no avail. Um, the aircraft impacted hills uh, outside of Athens with a tremendous force that destroyed the aircraft and, and anyone on board. So um, a very, very tragic accident. Um, now, the accident investigation, once again, I'd like you to read the summary of the investigation here in the, um, in the link that I have provided in the description of the video. But, but basically the investigation came with the following causes. So the direct causes to the accident was the non-recognition of the faulty um, setting of the um, pressurization mode selector from auto to manual. Okay, that was the direct cause of the accident. Also, the fact that it wasn't recognized neither during the pre-flight nor during the use of the pre-start checklist or in the after takeoff checklist. The next direct cause was the non understanding and misidentification of the cabin altitude warning horn um, and that led to the, the flight crew continuing the climb and then eventually leading to the uh, incapacitation of the flight crew due to hypoxia. Contributing forces here was uh, deficiencies in the operations and quality management of the airline and the safety culture in the airline. They had had several um, audits where this was indicated the years before this accident. So there were some problems in the management managerial team of the of, of Helios Airways at the time. Also, they were um, they pointed at the regulatory authorities, the fact that they weren't strong enough to adequately uh, evaluate the uh, safety of the operators that had to report to them. So that's um, that's another contributing factor and also inadequate use and application of CRM because at any given point during this accident if someone would have spoken up if one of the flight crew was going down the wrong path and misunderstood the problem the other one is supposed to pick that up they're supposed to at least come with the suggestion that maybe this has something to do with the precisation or at least monitor the systems for ongoing development of the failure this didn't happen. Also, the cabin crew um, could have intervened. They could have contacted the flight crew or tried to contact them uh, or try to gain access to the uh, cab to the cockpit at an earlier point before the aircraft ran out of fuel. All of this is indicative of lack of training, um, lack of procedures and lack of CRM, unfortunately. There were also mentions in the final report about the ineffectiveness of the manufacturer, in this case Boeing, to implement measures taken after similar accidents or incidents. There had been problems with this warning system and the 
pressurization issues in the 737 before um, and they needed to be changed to procedures or these procedures needed to be adequately communicated to flight crews and that was also finding in the um, final report. And finally uh, a contributing factor was the fact that the engineers had not switched the uh, switch back from manual to auto as part of the maintenance procedure. Um, that the cabin crew procedures had not really taken into account what happens if you have a subtle um, depressurization, what happens if the flight crew doesn't respond in the way that you expect it to, um, and that comes down to CRM training and crew training ultimately. So that's it guys. That's the reason I wanted to do this video was I wanted to point at the, how important it is that we follow and apply the correct procedures, that we understand the correct procedures and also that we have the, you know, the needed technical knowledge to be able to determine one fault from another fault even though the indications might be similar depending on the phase of flight. This is really important. Right? And we've learned a ton from this. There's been changes to how the cockpit is made on the 737. We now have warning lights that indicate if it's a takeoff comfy warning and a cabin altitude warning. We have ad added checklist items. The precision mode selector is now a single item on our checklist. There is clear training about hypoxia. What happens if you have a subtle in, uh, incapacitation or a subtle depressurization of an aircraft for example. Cabin crew training, cabin crew procedures, what if they don't hear anything from the cockpit? How do they proceed? All of this has been improved after this accident and it's made the aviation world a safer place to be and that's the point I wanted to make. That's it guys, I hope that you liked this episode. Uh, if you like this kind of content, then make sure that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the notification bell. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are and I'll see you next time, bye-bye. Right guys, I really hope that you liked that. If you want more content like that, more aviation content, well then, check this out. Uh, I hope that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the little notification bell. See you inside of the Mentor Aviation app and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye-bye.